495. I am your host, Doug Sparks, Editor-in-Chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Uh, with me right now is Julie Skolnick, who is the um, Artistic Director of Mistral Music. Julie, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, so I, I wanted to, it, it's, we're, we're about a minute late because we we're trying to uh, resolve some technical issues. Uh, and one of the things we were hoping to do... to leave that behind the curtain. Uh, it's, well, <laughs> but it, it leads into my first question. Uh, because I, it, it's a semi-related, you know, like trying to find, trying to perform and get your music out to, to people now is, is tricky. But if this was 2019, I would, I would have had this question for you right off the bat. Okay. which is about streaming services because streaming services are are it's a difficult avenue for 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 classical music right mm -hmm. uh and i'm just wondering what you what do you what you think about because if you think of I mean, streaming services which is how a lot of people get their music right now yeah. uh are, are sort of developed around pop music and rock where you have one artist right so if you if you want to hear uh you know leonard cohen Right. You go to the Leonard Cohen section. And there's a bunch of his records. All right. But with jazz and classical, it's been really, really tricky. Like, do you do you stream music? Do you listen to CDs? How do you get music yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a bit embarrassed to tell you how little I listen to my CDs these days when I have thousands of them and I plan to hear them. But what's happened is you get very, very lazy. Uh, you know, we have an Alexa app, uh, an Alexa, three Alexas in the house. Yeah. And basically, I can tell her to play anything for me. Okay. Or if, if I'm doing some kind of research, if I'm planning programs and I want to remember what a certain string quartet sounds like, the easiest way is to just go to YouTube and see somebody play it live. So, you know, I have all that stuff in my drawers of CDs, which I can show you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so easy. We've gotten so spoiled. It's so easy to put on a CD, and we still think that's too much work, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I do listen to streamed music. Um, I listen to live concerts, at least I used to. Yeah. Um, nowadays, there is such a, a a plethora of choices for the music lover out there. You know, everybody, all the music um, organizations want to stay engaged with their audience members, so they are making all their archive of concerts available and free to anybody who wants them. There, some people are trying to monetize a bit by. Um, saying, you know, if you want our live stream address, here's a, here's a little link, you pay $10, you get this whole concert. But it, right now, um, you know, the Metropolitan Opera, every, every so many different groups are just putting all of their past concerts online to be available to people. It's kind of overwhelming in terms of choices. Yeah. Do you like that? Do you, do you like watching on YouTube? I mean, I, I just kind of feel... I know, I know there's people like Glenn Gould who preferred recorded music and he didn't like the live experience, but you're losing something critical. Oh God, you are losing 90% of what the experience is. I'm totally there for you. Oh, you know what? I wrote something down. I want to see if I can find it, if you don't mind. No, I don't. Um, I just wrote something down that I read because, oh, yeah, this is what Simon Rattle said. Uh, you know who Simon Rattle yeah, is? sure. Famous British conductor. Yeah, and you've, you've been in the news with him recently because yes, you were, we're, and you can, you can go ahead. I'll let you run with yes. it. Oh, you just did, you really did your homework. But I love what he said here, which is um, orchestral music, and he also means chamber music too, is a live experience and requires all the participants, performers and listeners alike, to be in the same room together. Mm -hmm. What we may do individually over the internet in these months is all well and good, but the living core of our work is a live communion, a sharing of space, art, and emotion, which is both vital and healing. Whoopsie, I seem to have lost you. How do I find you again? Hold on. <laughs> I've, I've um, got you. Can you hear me? You, yes, yes. Oh, there we are. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, I like that quote because it, it just describes exactly what we miss so much. But, you know, so what if you can... Um, hear anything you want on on youtube and your little screen even if you want to hook it onto your tv yeah it's not the same it, it, communal experience of sitting with people you love friends family loved ones and having an experience together in a concert hall that's why everyone is just so brokenhearted about what's going on right now yeah so for people who are unfamiliar with with mistral music uh what is the organization what type of music do you perform and how would you describe it Oh, okay. How much time do you have? 
as much um, time as you need. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I say Mistral, Mistral, Mistral rather than Mistral. Okay. Mistral is the name of um, a, a powerful wind in the south of France, and we chose that name because um, it, it, a bit of an in-joke, family lore type of thing. My husband is in wind energy. I play a wind instrument. We're both Francophiles. Mm -hmm. um, we spend a lot of time in France where people talk a lot about the Mistral wind, like, oh, the Mistral, it's made a mess of my fig tree. My, all the figs are on the ground. You know. So Mistral seemed like the right name for us. And if you remember the movie Chocolat, does that ring a bell to you? Yeah. Who, who, um, who, who is the Johnny lead in Depp, it? Johnny Depp is a kind of a right. pirate. A, a, a woman and her daughter go from town to town um, opening up chocolate stores. And as soon as the Mistral comes, something in the air, it's kind of like her, her grandmother's spirit, something in the air gets under her skin and she needs to leave. Well, I, I liked this idea of associating um, the Mistral wind with a music group that we started about 20, 23, 24 years ago. We used to have a different name. It was, this was when I was living up in Andover with my family. And um, I had been a busy freelancer for the past 20 years before that. And I thought, gee, I, you know, I'm just far enough outside of Boston where if I started my own ensemble or music series, it might, make a, it might be a great thing for people who love music but don't want to get on Route 93 and look for parking and fight traffic and pay for this and that. And so I brought all my very wonderful music friends up to Andover to play concerts with me. We used to be called Andover Chamber Music. And then um, Mistral was always the name of our ensemble in residence. And that ensemble would be, be invited to play at various other venues. So Mistral was always part of our identity. But then when we moved to Brookline about six or seven years ago, um, the whole name changed to just Mistral Music. And to get back to your question of what kind of music, so Mistral has a core of maybe seven or eight artist members, but every concert, may, most of the concerts do have guests. And so the audience members will see many faces that they recognize from past concerts, faces they've come to love and know well, but then there will be new people, you know, like sometimes guests from the Boston Symphony that uh, my audiences are all excited to see because they've seen them in Symphony Hall, or guests from Chicago Symphony or New York Phil or the Metropolitan Opera or Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, so right now, because I've, I've been around, uh, I know a lot of great musicians in the, all over the country, even in France. So I invite different ones to come be part of our concerts. And the main idea that I always want to get across in these concerts is that, uh, and, our, and our motto is unstuffy, unpredictable, unmatched. So we don't like the stuffy classical music concert. We want to break down barriers. We want to talk to our audiences. We want them to have fun and not feel that it's a dead art where you're not supposed to clap or you're not supposed to, or where you're supposed to know so much about the music before you go. We try to get people to understand that we're just all experiencing something we enjoy together. For us, the, the reactions that they give us are just as important as, as what we're giving them. And um, we couldn't do it without them, Just which brings us back to your original question about streaming and why live music is so important. And in terms of repertoire, we play just about everything. We span maybe you know, four centuries um, you know, from the Baroque, early, early Baroque, you know, 17th century, all the way to present time. I've been very careful with my audiences, though, not to play um, music that offends. I, I, I want to represent living composers, but I do feel that a lot of composers, some, some composers, let's just say some, I, let's just put it this way, I find music that I know my audiences will love as much as I do whether they were written yesterday or 400 years ago, because there's so much gorgeous music of today. And some of the pieces that are atonal and very cacophonous, difficult to listen to, gives new music a bad name. You know, there are some old timers who say, oh, I'm not coming to a concert if I don't recognize the names of every composer on your program. And that's just plain sad and wrong. But most of the people who come to our concerts have learned to trust me and trust my taste and know that I'm not going to force them to listen to something 
that's unpleasant to listen to. Yeah, so let's talk about that. I found that interesting. On, on the, I was mentioning before the show started that I was listening to a CD you put out with your daughter, who's also a musician, on the way up here. And it was very beautiful, and it was very soothing, and I was going in and out of parts of, um, I was going in, I was going under and out of the rain clouds as it was <laughs> happening, and it was this really exquisite soundtrack to my, to my commute up to the, to the podcast studio. Um, and, you know, it just, it just felt very, like, the music just felt very intimate. There was complexity. There was, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't lulling me to sleep, but it was very beautiful. And I, I do think a lot of times people struggle, contemporary audiences struggle with new music because of the dissonance. Yeah. Because it became so academic or so, yeah. I, I, I don't know, avant-garde or something. But mm -hmm. I also wonder if there are composers out there now who are bucking that trend. Uh, it oh, seems like yeah. a lot of the minimalists are creating music that's very, very beautiful. Uh, and then people like Max Richter. I don't know if you know Max Richter. There's there seem to be there seem to be some young European composers that I know of, and I don't I'm not too deep in that world who are making very listenable music that also has depth. Oh, there's hundreds. Thou I probably could say thousands. Hmm. Absolutely true. Um, and we program a lot of it too. We, you know, we, and there were Boston composers who are fabulous. Um, it's just that we have to teach audience members that. Music written today can be beautiful. That's all I like. How I like to think of it, you know. And it's not. It's not all dissonant. It's um. It's tonal music. I don't. I don't. I don't listen to atonal music. Why would I? You know. I don't. I don't do anything just because I think I'm supposed to, and I also don't program atonal music just because I think that my peers will respect me more. I, I want to give the composers of today a voice in this world that. Of course we do, and not not just to be nice, but because but because their music is so valuable, and and um, you know these new sound worlds will bring you to places that the old dead guys cannot bring you to. So you just have to educate yourself and and you know um, bring that music to the masses so they understand. Even 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 you know every major orchestra is programming music of today. Every chamber music group is programming music of today as well. Are there any composers, any big name sort of canonical composers that you don't care for and that you avoid? Ma, 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 ma. Well, I don't know if, um, gee, that's a very good question. You're talking like out of the main yeah. 10, you know, Beethoven, Bach, Mendelssohn. No, no, I can't say that any of the great greats are, I love them all. I love them all. I mean, um, you know, what can I say? There are some B, B composers that I don't program. And by B composers, I mean people like Rika. There's a lot of flute composers. They're just, if I have a choice, I won't, I won't program because music. Because, huh? why is that? Not, not a lot of depth, not, a, not beautifully composed, not, not interesting enough, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, too cutesy or too, too corny or, you know, stuff like that. Sure. But all greats, but you know, Debussy, Ravel, Shostakovich, all of the Russians. I mean, there are so many. The main problem for me in any given concert is um, limiting it to two hours. You know, people like short concerts, but it's really hard for me to keep them short. Um, every now and then, it'll, it'll be, uh, you know, about an hour and a half, but most of them hover at around two hours and if the intermission goes a little long, then it's a little over two hours. Yeah. Um, but I know people like short concerts, so I always, I always try to remember that nobody. Although there are some pretty diehard fans who would sit there for four hours if we kept playing for them. Sure. You know? So I, I wanted to talk to you about your your programming and how you put the programs together, and I also wanted to bring in this literary component because it seems to be important. To, to the way you put the music together, right? Do you have a background in literature or is that just part of this overall interest you have in, in French culture? I'm so impressed that you did so much homework. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's a fantastic question. I think that one of the reasons I love having my own baby, my own series like this, is because of the creative outlet that it gives me to do just the kind of thing that you're talking about. Um, I do happen to have a degree in French, but that's just kind of beside the point. Not on purpose, you know. Um, when I went to college, I was one of these people who I had first gone to Exeter for my high school years, and I, 
I kind of learned to be hungry for more than just music. So I didn't go to a conservatory when I was finished. I wanted to learn about the world, the li life. And of course, a lot of it was literature, French and English and all of that kind of thing. So when I did spend a year in Paris and I my, learned about Proust for the first time and, and always carried with me the, um, some of the things I remembered in Proust, his particular uh, affinity for describing the visceral experience that music has when, on people when they listen to it, which is a very, very difficult thing to describe, but he does it amazingly, which is why we, at, at this point, after 24 years or so, we've had three Proust concerts. Yeah. And interspersed in those concerts are readings from his novel, um, those parts that describe a certain piece of music that he loved. And um, back to my own programming, I do like um, I do like the interrelationship of all the arts. I think that if I'm going to go to this much trouble to found my own chamber music series and ensemble, then I'm not going to just you know take the easy way out. And the easy way out, and this is not to uh, point fingers at anybody at all, but um, the easy way out is just to say, okay, for this next concert, I'm going to pick one Mozart, one Dvorak, and one Shostakovich, and that'll be one concert, and then the next kind. So what I try to do is find ways that put programs together thematically so that there's something to people to sink their teeth into in terms of, mar and for us to sink our teeth into when we're marketing it. That's why we give all of our concerts um, titles um, over the course of those, you know, 24 years. All my concerts have been... Um, thematic, which is, as you know, not that easy, sometimes not that easy. And sometimes I find myself in a box. Okay, this leads right into your, into your question on how I think up um, programs. But sometimes what happens is that I will think of a certain piece that I want to do. And then I think of other pieces that might go well with it. And sometimes it's a question of, oh, I have to hire a trumpet for that particular sextet. So I don't want to just bring them in just for that piece. So I'll let him also play this piece, and and this piece will go with it because it's also about the blah blah blah, you know. So it's always a question of how to find pieces that work well together, and not just um, the uh, the other easy way out is to just say, oh, this is going to be all English music or all Russian music or all French music, which I have been guilty of doing myself over the years, but we, I try to avoid it, you know. Sometimes. One of the ones I liked a lot, um, oh, the reason it was so great to do a Proust concert is that Proust writes about so many different pieces that have nothing to do with each other. So Proust was my connection to all this. He loved Beethoven, string quartet in particular. He loved Franck, so we did the Franck piano quintet with that. He loved Debussy, and we did a Debussy trio. So those three composers already are entirely different, but we were able to put them together in the same program just because Proust connected them all. And we could, you know, read things from the books that we that okay. scholars have decided were about the Franck Quintet or about the Franck Violin Sonata and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so what are you pulling thematically out? In, I'm going to assume that, that not everyone, believe it or not, who's who's listening now has read Proust. Have you read the entire novel, by the way? I have not. You I'm have sure. not. And by the way, yeah. this is this is uh, this is typical, even some very serious Proustians people who, who like to study and read Proust haven't read the entire book because it's so long. It's really like nine kind of seven. novels in one. Yes, seven. Seven. A la recherche du temps perdu. Remembrance of things past. Uh, <laughs> Lou is going right to, now to Amazon on his phone to, <laughs> no, yeah, to no. order. So, but what are the themes? I rely that, on you, Doug. <laughs> okay. What are, what are the themes that come out of Proust that relate to music in the sort of thematic experience of listening to music? Oh, such a good question. And one that I'm able to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um Proust, for one thing, he was enamored, let's see, how do I put this? His main themes were childhood, memory, love, music, and heartbreak, mm -hmm. probably. And the way he tied all those themes together is what was so fascinating. The main character, the narrator, um, and the main, the main character, whose name is Swan, is madly in love with a woman named Odette. 
But the way he describes it is associating her with a certain piece of music. In his mind, there was no greater connection in the world than between love and music. And so every time he heard this piece, it was like he was convinced he was in love with her. He really confused his emotional response to the music and art, paintings, talks a lot about art, with his love for this woman. So that, that's one theme he talks about a lot, how a piece of music, well, actually, he talks about the Madeleine. So for him, you know, he dunks the famous iconic Madeleine in the tea. Which is, he, which is a cake for people. Don't, it's a little cake, and they sell them in Starbucks now. Exactly. Um, he tastes it and it brings back his childhood memories of being at his grandmother's house. I, in fact, even before I did Proust concerts, I would always write these messages from the director. And one of my big themes when I'm bringing these pieces to my audiences is to say that I remember every, every piece. I, I remember the moment when I fell in love with every piece of music from my past. And when I bring it to my audiences, I'm hoping that this piece will do something for them as it did for me. You know, so I can remember the first time I heard the Schubert cello quintet when I was at music camp at age 13. And then I always used to write to, to these audience members in my messages that, you know, the Madeleine may have done it for Proust in bringing back his visceral memories. But for me, nothing brings back a certain period of my life as strongly, intensely, as hearing a piece of music that I first discovered when I was much younger. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to me. And that's a lot of what Proust talks about in different ways, memory, childhood, things like that. Sure. So 2020 must be a difficult year to put together. Well, maybe difficult, maybe exceptionally easy to put together a program because this is one of the most unusual years any of us has ever lived through. Well, our, you know, our season goes from September to April. So we're at a lull right now anyway. We did have to cancel our April concert, mm. which was extremely heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, my little problems of my tiny series were pretty insignificant compared to what was going on all over the world. Sure. Uh, the thing is, nobody expected that this was going to go on more than four or five months. So now we're faced with the new season. This would be our 24th season. And I've been a bit shell-shocked about it. Um, I did almost have the whole season planned, but now I'm not sure I'm going to keep those programs. Um, you know, my programs are always so involved and complicated, and I do posters and I do brochures and this and that. I think what we might do, and we're going to be discussing it with our board, is we will have five concerts, but they will be live streamed. Um, we will do them in our normal venue, but probably to no audience or we may do it to 50 people sitting three seats apart from each other. We're gonna have to send out some kind of doodle poll to see if any of our audience members would come, but I kind of doubt it. I think people aren't ready for that. At least they won't be ready till uh, January, February. So for our first three, three concerts, I'm hoping that my musicians are still willing to get together and we will record a program and um, or, or, or stream it live and see how that works. I already set up a professional live streamer to come for our first concert in September. And we'll just see how it goes. I think we're just going to play it by ear. Yeah. So thematically, you, you said you were a little bit shell-shocked uh, putting this one together. Are, are, you, are you rethinking what you're going to do as far as an overarching theme or overarching themes? How are you going to handle yes. what's going on right now? Yeah. You, you, you're a really good interviewer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, well, normally, so I was going to do, my first concert was going to be called uh, something like Songs of the Earth because of all the climate hmm. change stuff we're dealing with. And there are so many great pieces in that idea. I was going to do a Brahms horn trio because Brahms used the horn to kind of uh, connote uh, hunting and woods and trees and this and that. But what I think I might do instead is just play pieces I know people are going to love, kind of iconic pieces, not too esoteric. You know, the first one may be the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. The second one, I don't know, Still, we still could do, I wanted to do a program of just women composers. I think I'm just gonna wait until, you know, a month before the concert happens and decide then to just see what the, what the climate feels like, see if people are, 
you know, people get get sick of of tuning into live streaming too. I'm not sure. Um, I think people have been doing it so long. I don't feel like listening to live stream concerts that much anymore. A little bit, maybe five minutes, not two hours. You know, mm. it's just too much. We want a different experience now. We did start something this summer, um, but the weather hasn't been very cooperative. We started bringing um, some chamber music to a park nearby in Brookline, which has been really nice because people are starved for that. And they brought um, blankets and lawn chairs and wine. And uh, we set up a string quartet and flute. And um, we were distanced and played some music for them. And it was just so great. It felt like the tiniest attempt at normalcy. And I'm hoping to do it again this weekend if, if it doesn't rain. And then again on July 10th. And you've been doing some benefit shows too, right? Or well, benefit, yeah. you're, you're, you're showing old shows to raise money for different organizations, is that well, right? No, we didn't do that yet. Um, the one that you might be thinking of that we did for a benefit for the NAACP was one of the concerts that my kids and I just uh, recorded. Um, we just recorded it in this beautiful living room that we have. That's our piano, you can see that. Um, and um, we did a program that was a combination of flute, cello, piano, and then we put it on Facebook as kind of a live video event that anyone could watch, but it gave the people an opportunity. It didn't cost anything, but if people wanted to, they could donate to the NAACP after the horrible atrocities that were going on in our country. It's, it's pretty hard as a musician to just go online and say, oh, we want to play this concert for you without tying it into any um, bigger causes. This just makes you look and feel so kind of, um, you know, self-centered and narcissistic. Hey, everybody, listen to us play music. You know, yeah. So it was nice to tie it into something important. Well, and yet at the same time, uh, music has this healing property. Like if people have legitimate problems right now and they might downplay them but people a lot of people are struggling o overdoses are up anxiety is up there's there's all these kind of problems and there's there's so much sort of tension and conflict in the world that sometimes people maybe maybe do need music and, and can let themselves be a little bit selfish and to allow themselves to be nurtured by that uh, hey, so, so, I totally agree with you on that one I really do and so I maybe this is exactly what we need yeah I, I, I agree with you. I just hope that that people, I mean, I think you're probably right. People need to get away from the news too. And they need to yeah. just, they need to be reminded that there's beauty in the world and the healing properties of music will definitely do that. I agree with you. I was reading the article uh, from 2018 about the 89 year old woman who went into cardiac arrest during, uh, during one of your performances. Could you tell that story, please? Yes, of course. Speaking of healing. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. Um, it was a November concert, and uh, one of our regulars, although I didn't know her at the time, um, was sitting in the front row and slumped onto the person next to her. And the person next to her, you know, didn't know what to do, got my husband's attention. My husband is a bit of the stage manager guy. Uh, he's actually a brilliant physicist. People only know him as the guy who moves the furniture at the concerts, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so um, my husband tapped me on the shoulder. I was literally lifting my flute up to begin a piece. And he said, can you hold the music? And then um, he said, is there medical help in the audience? And four women, four women from just from the first two rows um, came to this woman whose heart had completely stopped, complete cardiac arrest, lay her down on the floor at the stage, next to the stage, and started administering uh, CPR and um, chest compressions. And um, for a very long time, uh, you know, one of them was feeling her pulse, one was doing the mouth, mouth to mouth, other was doing the chest compressions. And, um, and the whole audience was watching horrified and uh, as were the musicians. And then she started breathing. And, um, and then they said they were taking her to the hospital and she kept saying, but I just want to stay and listen to the music. Why are you doing this to me? And it was just heartbreaking. Um, and she just kept wondering, asking why they would just wouldn't leave her alone and let her listen to the music. Anyway, the EMTs came, they um, brought the ambulance. So they took her out on a stretcher. My husband went in the ambulance with her. 
to the hospital and we played the rest of the concert. It would have been very different had she not come to. I don't think we would have been able to just say, okay, now the next piece. But um, everybody was so relieved that she was going to be fine. Mm. And, um, and then we told them what had happened and we told the audience that anybody could save her uh, another person's life if they go learn the training. And then the next day, my husband and I went to the hospital and I played some flute for her in her hospital room, which was really the least we could do. Hmm. And uh, she was so appreciative. We made it onto the front page of the globe, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a story. And that, that gave us a new, um, a new motto, Mistral, it'll bring you back to life. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's great. So I wanted to talk to you about a, a, a related Maybe on the surface, it might not be related, but I want to talk to you about music and arts education. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel that that music education in schools was sort of under threat before the pandemic. And I, I like you worry about what the state of music education is going to be going into next year and the year after that. Do you think about that? I have to admit, I, I think about a lot of that stuff, but I'm not thinking so much about the music education, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. Um, um, I, I, I'm not even that aware of whether is music completely gone from this. We used to bring music into the schools in Lawrence and still do that because they have no budget for the arts. Hmm. And we bring flute and harp or flute and some strings and the kids have never seen any of this stuff. Um, I really don't know how to answer that very well to tell you the truth. Um, it's concerning since, you know, the more kids are exposed to the arts, their deeper lives they will live. It helps in so many ways, you know, so, so many ways to, to have an education in, in music. Um, there are articles all the time by neuro, neurologists about how the brain can benefit from, from being exposed to music at a young age and all that. Mm. So yeah. a, a final question I have before I turn it over to Lou, because Lou always has a, a question or two for the guests, is how do people access your music right now? Oh, well, we have a website. It's called, uh, oh, first of all, you can go to our, our website, mistralmusic.org, and that has all of our videos connected to our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel must have dozens and dozens of videos. People can watch entire pieces. I'm just trying to remember whether it's Mistral Chamber Music or Mistral Music. You can find us. I think it's Mistral Chamber Music on YouTube station. Hmm. Um, and then we have a Facebook page, which is it's we want people to stay in touch with us that way because um, we often post videos from past concerts. It's a way of telling people whether we're playing in the park or not in, in you know, with very little notice, like this Saturday in two days from now, we're going to play it in, in the Brookline Park. And um, so the Facebook page is also Mr. All Chamber Music. We do have Twitter and Instagram, but I don't know how to use those. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, as soon as I put something on Facebook, somebody else puts it on the other two sites for me. Facebook is all I could really handle. Sure. And, so uh, for people who prefer physical media, and there, there still are people out there, oh, I think they're in a minority, yeah, yeah. can you still buy CDs? Absolutely. We have some beautiful CDs. We don't push them. We don't advertise them. We usually just have them on a table at all our concerts. Hmm. I could probably make a big deal about them on our website if people want them. These days, you know, CDs are going out. So we're almost just giving these CDs away. In fact, anybody who wants one of my CDs with my daughter, just contact me and I'll send you one. <laughs> and maybe you could just tell people how to contact me. Okay. Can I give them my email address? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So my email address is J-U-L-S-C-O-L -S at me.com, jewelskull at me.com. And, you know, I'm not trying to make 10 bucks off each little CD I send out. I just want to get rid of this enormous box of CDs because nobody is buying CDs these days right. except some of the old people. Sometimes we have a CD giveaway at these concerts. Like I'll ask some little trivia question. Does anybody know how Lou Lee died? You know, and the answer is that he was tapping the floor with his cane. This is 1600s and he put it right through his foot, which turned gangrene and <laughs> killed him. But anyway, so if somebody knows the answer to that, they get a CD. But what usually happens is they say, oh, sorry, I don't have any way to play this. So I say, all right, give it back to you. <laughs> so um, they are becoming obsolete. But anybody who wants one of my CDs that I made with my daughter, I'm happy to send them. Uh, obsolete now. When they when they change the laws around streaming services and when things change, mm. you never know. Yeah. I think there's still, I still, 
uh, actually listen to CDs and I like physical media yeah. and part of it's the sound quality. Like listening to a CD through two channel audio with a decent, it, it yeah. sounds so nice. It fills the room. It doesn't I give you the same that. 3D quality of, of seeing it live in performance, but it comes a little bit closer. And look so, at the Renaissance in vinyl yeah. recently. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. So Lou, did you have any questions for uh, Julie? Yeah, Julie, um, I'm going to dumb down this conversation. I'm going to be that guy because it's kind of my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> How did, what's your relationship with a John Williams, and how do you feel about the fact that most of our connections, the Imperial March is our main connection to classical music these days? Oh, how do I feel about John Williams? He's a genius. Yeah. We love John Williams. I mean, you can't say enough amazing superlative things about this guy. His music is as good as anyone's music. I mean, it's not just Superman and Star Wars. He, he's written some gorgeous, um, I mean, I don't know his chamber music. There were sections of these big orchestral pieces um, that are so beautiful. In fact, I'm so excited because I just discovered a an arrangement for three three strings and flute of Leah's love theme. The one that's da 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 You know that really beautiful one? So we're gonna put that at one of our next concerts um, we're going to bring it to the park, if we can, too. A fantastic composer. The world is going to suffer an enormous loss when he's, when he's gone. Uh, we talked about uh, all the dead guys you referenced in the past and, and, yeah. and current composers and things like that. Is there any consistent and identifiable way to determine who is who? In other words, if I gave you a piece of music you haven't listened to before, is there modern influence? Can you say, well, that came from... That came from the 20th century. That came from, you know, this century, or that came from the 1800s. Can you identify it through influences in society that society has had on these composers over time? All right. So, are you saying that could you put on any piece from any century, and or are you saying? Um, in other words, if I played you a piece you hadn't heard before, would you be able to say that's a that's a 2000 piece or that's a 2010 piece because you identify the way society has. Has, has um, so influenced composer. A, a recent-ish recent piece. Yeah. I'm not sure I would be able to do that, tell you the truth, no. Um, anything before 2000, maybe, you know, um, 20 years ago, um, there's such a wide range. The, the spectrum is just too, too complex and elaborate to say that I would be able to identify anything. There are certainly people who might might be able to, but the, the range of compositions of today's composers is just so extreme. Yeah, is it, there is there a lot of cross-pollination? In other words, if you look at uh, country music these days, there's some R&B coming in there and even some hip-hop coming into country music a little bit. Oh, yeah. All the musical styles are cross-pollinating. Are things slipping oh, into yeah. classical oh, composition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are new composers today who are using so many different jazz elements, not just ragtime, but klezmer, New Orleans, there, you know, there's a guy named Paul Schoenfield who uses all those elements. He's very big into jazz and, um, and it's so much fun to play his music for that reason. Um, there's definitely lots of cross-pollination, like you said. Does your group take compositions, any composition, and try to arrange it to your configuration, or do you pick out music that was composed for your configuration? Yes, indeed. We do a lot of that. In fact, people say, why do you make your life so complicated? <laughs> <laughs> I am constantly cutting, pasting, Xeroxing, <laughs> taping, oh, doing this kind of thing. Because, oh, well, just to give you an example, there's a beautiful, oh, for one thing, I really like making chamber arrangements of bigger pieces because I don't play in orchestras anymore ever since I started my own thing. And I miss some of that repertoire. So for instance, um, uh, the Chopin Piano Concerto number two, a really, really beautiful piece. That's very much like chamber music because it's very intimate. There are parts that sound like it was written for five instruments. Um, so I looked and looked and looked for um, a, an, a, an arrangement. I did find somebody who made an arrangement for string quintet and piano. And he incorporated all the wind and brass parts into that. But I wasn't gonna let them have all the fun <laughs> because in the original concerto, there were some really beautiful flute parts. So I wanted those flute parts back. 
So what I had to do, and I wanted the bassoonist to get his parts back. So what we had to do is flute and bassoon each took our own original parts. And when it came to one of those big solos, I'd say to whoever, whichever string part had it incorporated into his part, don't play from H to I, <laughs> that's a flute part. So anyway, it's a, a certain amount of work, but then it, we came up with a really beautiful arrangement, which you can hear on our YouTube station. But otherwise, sometimes we commission people to take a huge orchestral work and make it into a chamber arrangement, even something as enormous as a Mahler symphony. I found a guy in England who, um, who was happy to do an arrangement of Mahler one for us, and people could not believe that you could take a piece of that magnitude and spread it over 13 players. I mean, it's not five players, but 13 players, including percussion and brass and woodwinds and then five strings and fill it out in such a way that we weren't missing a full symphony orchestra. And the beauty of that is that all the parts that do sound like chamber music, and there are many in Mahler, Mahler's music, really were chamber music. We were listening to each other and playing the way you do when you're playing a conversation in chamber music, rather than watching a conductor telling us how to put this together. So yes, we do a lot of that. And, and and I'm sorry. And finally, for me, if you are, are listening to, and I hate to use the term because it couches the conversation, something more mainstream, you're not listening to classical music, you're listening to something more mainstream, who are you listening me? to? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I first to admit that I, um, when I get up in the morning, I want to clean up my room. I, I ask Alexa to put on Ingrid Michaelson station. I like pop singers like that. I also like French singers like Maxime Le Forestier and Jacques Brel and all those guys. I love klezmer music. I love Ella Fitzgerald. I love Billie Holiday. I love Jelly Roll Morton. I love all this stuff. I, it's a certain, it's hard to explain, but when I listen to classical music, sometimes the associations are so, um, are so personal and related to work that it doesn't take me away and give me the kind of relaxation relief that I'm looking for when I'm exercising or doing something else so yeah a lot of um you know folk and and pop music i do like especially especially people like uh you know ella fitzgerald and stuff. that's great well i hope i mean as i said earlier um it's kind of the perfect day to to listen to your music i hope people go to the youtube station and and check you out and listen so they can hear for themselves if they haven't heard already and uh, get on your facebook page to find out what's going to be happening this fall thank you so much for, oh, you're for so joining welcome. me. It was really fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. I, I enjoyed it as well. And I'm sorry I'm not playing my flute, but believe me, I, I'd rather you hear something that sounds good because I, I did try to play on a Zoom call once and I recently heard the result. It was just horrible. Yeah, well, when, when the technology is right, we'll, we'll try it again and, and we'll okay. do something live. Thank you so much. Uh, so next week on the 495, our guest is going to be the artistic director of the MRT, Courtney Sale. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. I'll see everybody next week. Thank you.